Yeah, 50 years ago, Buffalo Springfield said something was happening here and what it was, wasn't exactly clear. And that is as true today as it was then. And Retake Our Democracy in this radio show, in our blog, in our Zoominars, in our alert system, in everything we do is trying to keep you informed about what's going on and helping you make it easier for you to do something about it. Good morning. Uh, you're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. each Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. I'll be interviewing um, ex the exec new executive director of the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, um, that's for Virginia Necacheo, uh, Chea, and a uh, longtime staff attorney at the NMELC, Eric Jantz. But before we get to Virginia and Eric, uh, I have a few announcements. Um, last week, I interviewed Miguel Acosta, a Retake Our Democracy board member, a co-director of Earth Care and Yucca, and a strong advocate for social and racial justice. It was a tremendous interview and well worth hearing. Um, you can watch all our past shows by going to Retake Our Democracy, um, dot org and hovering over the actions and events menu and um, clicking on retake conversations and our interviews will all appear there. And if you're driving around town today and you don't catch all of today's interview, um, we generally have the recording up on the website oh, by 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, sometimes we post it on Friday night um, so you can get a preview. Um, so um, I did want to mention that just Wednesday we published in our blog our 2021 legislative strategy and the list of 15 transformational bills and 25 priority bills for which we are advocating. Uh, I highly recommend checking out uh, that, uh, that list and getting involved in our advocacy strategy. Um, we are um, uh, being very proactive this session and launching communication and you know, with our legislators at the end of this month. And so if you go to retakeourdemocracy.org and um, go to the legislation menu, you'll see our legislative strategy, you'll see our uh, legislative bills, and um, you'll see how you can get involved. And we've got a very interesting strategy this go round. We're gonna be um, trying to um, reach out to senators with coordinators from every Senate district in the state that is held by a Democrat, uh, Democratic Senator, and reach out to them in, Jan in December before the session begins and start talking about our key bills and educating them and encouraging them, telling them we have their back and um, implicitly also saying we have some expectations of uh, uh, this new Senate getting some serious work done in 2021. And while you're at our website, check out our Zoom that's scheduled for December 1st with Speaker of the House Brian Egolf and Senator Peter Wirth. Um, go to retakeourdemocracy.org and hover over uh, the uh, actions and events page, menu rather, and you'll see this Zoom in our listed there. You can click on and get a seat in the Zoom room. We'll be discussing the results of the election and also the results of some of the uh, uh, caucus decisions that were made um, this week um, in terms of selecting uh, Democratic Party leadership, particularly in the Senate. Um, we'll also talk about our legislative bills that we're supporting and um, what the Democratic Party leadership feels um, is likely to be um, uh, passable, if you will. Um, that's enough for now. Um, I want to turn, well, before we do, I do want to emphasize that um, today, um, the Senate is meeting in caucus in a Zoom caucus meeting, and they're going to be voting on the pro tem and the Senate pro tem. This is a critical position in the Senate leadership, as the pro tem is the person who makes all decisions about who will be the chair of each of the committees in the uh, in the uh, set in the in the Senate. And you'll recall from past years. Um, John Arthur Smith, Clemente Sanchez had ruled um, the corporations and finance committees with an iron fist and anything smacking of a progressive bill would wind up landing in the, one of those committees and often died there. 
Um, so we're going to be very interested in seeing how this plays out in the New Mexico State Senate caucus meeting uh, this afternoon. That's enough for this right now. Let's uh, turn our attention to uh, the new executive director of the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, Virginia Necochea, and New Mexico Environmental Law Center staff attorney, Eric Jantz. Well, welcome, uh, Virginia and uh, Eric. It's good to have you with us. Uh, we've had a hard time making this happen between internet collapses and everything else going on, but uh, welcome to the show. Um, I always like to let our uh, guests just interview, inter, inter, <coughs> introduce themselves. And so um, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about how you found yourself um, at uh, New Mexico Environmental Law Center, uh, Virginia, and then we'll let Eric introduce himself. Yes, thank you, Paul, for having us. We're really happy that we were finally able to make this work. <laughs> it's been challenging. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to do um, a land recognition and acknowledgement. That's very important for me as um, someone with Mexican indigenous roots and especially my connections to many of our indigenous communities across the state. And for me here in Albuquerque, um, I am a humble visitor on Tiwa land. So I just wanted to start with that. And yes, yeah, so, so I, I found, I've been part of um, EJ work for, for a while now. And I was the previous director of the Center for Social Sustainable Systems. And that's a small nonprofit um, that focused much of its work on water protection, urban acequia protection in the South Valley and also larger Middle Rio Grande region. Um, but also as a longtime educator, former faculty at UNM um, and advocate, you know, my, much of my work has centered on um, equity and especially anti-racism work for, for quite a while. So, um, you know, heading into, into the environmental justice um, field was just an extension of my longtime equity work and, and the priorities in my life. And again, very connected to uh, my own connections to um, ceremony and traditions and being taught by my elders who have led by example of what it means to be a steward of Mother Earth, um, Tonantzin. And so for me, it, it's just a natural part of the work that I do as um, someone who's in service to the protection of Mother Earth. And so I'm just really glad and humbled to be in this new role for me. Great, great. You know, Retake has always introduced our Zoominars, which are a, a longer version of something like this um, with the acknowledgement of the land. And uh, uh, I think I have to start doing that with the radio show as well. Um, Eric, um, how about you introduce yourself? Thanks, Paul, uh, and thanks, Virginia. Um, so uh, I, I, too, am a, a, a visitor on Tiwa land in Albuquerque. Um, and I want to start by uh, saying how excited uh, the staff is to have Virginia as our new exec director. Um, she is a, a great person uh, to lead us into the next phase of our organizational development. So we're really uh, thrilled to have her on board. Um, I've been with the Law Center since 2001. Uh, I started uh, working uh, my career at uh, legal services, DNA legal services in Crown Point out on Navajo. Um, and uh, environmental work and environmental justice and social justice have always been important uh, and critical to me. Uh, so I, I'm you know, grateful to Doug Mickeljohn, our founder, who gave me my shot at the Law Center in 2001. Um, and, uh, you know, since, since I started at the Law Center, our focus has always been uh, working with environmental justice communities, right? Uh, and addressing sort of the institutional and systemic barriers, racism that low-income communities of color face. And so, uh, you know, it was something, starting at the Law Center was something that was really resonated with me and, and throughout this, these 19 years, uh, it, had, it really has been a dream job. Um, and, it, it, and I'm looking forward to the, to the next phase. So um, 
throughout those 20, uh, 19 years, you know, we've, we've had some, you know, successes and some failures, but overall, you know, I think that, that it's been humbling to, to work with the communities that we, we work with. That's great. Um, yeah, your reputation definitely precedes you. Um, uh, Virginia, uh, now that you're on board, you outlined a little bit about your background and so forth and, and your priorities and, and so forth. Um, how is that going to practically influence the direction and operations of the New Mexico Environmental Law Center? Yeah, so for me, again, you know, it, it's such an honor and humbling to be in that position. And I'll be honest that it was a major decision, a major professional decision that I made to um, apply for this position, given my um, connection with CESOS and my work in the South Valley in the middle Rio Grande region. But what I, you know, I, I saw this as, as a really important opportunity for me to expand the work that I was doing, um, you know, beyond the communities that I was focusing on. And so for me, it's just, you know, again, it's just such an honor to have that opportunity to work closer um, with communities who are, who are being disproportionately impacted by environmental injustices to this day. It's just such an honor to be in this position to be able to connect with them. And, you know, major part of my priority, but it is, is about really centering environmental justice work. Um, but like Eric said, that's been part of the law center, um, you know, for a long time, but it, it, you know, there, when I, when I think about that in environmental justice and in my own trajectory in this field, it's so important that, that it just doesn't become like a trendy word that we use. And I've noticed that for a lot of environmental orgs, um, there's this mentioning of environmental justice work or the environmental justice movement. And I feel that sometimes that lacks that deep connection and understanding of what that truly means. And for me, as a woman of color, as a person who grew up literally, literally with my backyard being um, a factory, um, an industry, polluting industry, um, you know, in my, in my community, it's, it's really important that in, in true authentic environmental justice work that we center the voices of the people who are being most impacted. And so we have a major challenge before us. We have um, this opportunity for not just, um, you know, the, the you know, black indigenous people of color communities and, and leaders um, to, you know, to continue the work in the EJ movement, but there's also an opportunity for allies and accomplices that we have to really reflect on what it means when um, you're speaking to environmental justice work and how if, if that's truly the intent, then it means that we're gonna place the voices of frontline communities at the forefront at, you know, always that we are, you know, going to pause during our meetings, whether they're legislative meetings, whether they're community meetings, whether there are radio shows such as this one or um, events that we have and really take a look at who is being included, whose voices are being represented, who's being included, who's leading this movement, and especially who is not at the table. And for me, it's been um, a very important part of my work at, you know, to bring that up in, in meetings and just this work that I'm part of, of how important it is to highlight and put at the forefront the voices of the communities that are being disproportionately impacted by, and we have to name it, environmental racism. And for me, you cannot talk about environmental racism or environmental justice without placing environmental racism as a center point in the conversation. Because when you look at um, why certain communities continue to have polluting industries, toxic air, um, toxic water, toxic lands right next to them. It is no coincidence of why that happens. Sure. It's deliberate, it's intentional, there's strategy behind it. And if we're talking about environmental justice, it's important for us to name 
these inequities, it's important for us to name environmental racism because otherwise I really don't feel that we can achieve true environmental justice. And so for me that, you know, when you ask me about my priorities, as far as the organization, the people are my priority. The people most impacted will always be my priority. And as someone who um, grew up in an impacted community and who's been working um, towards you know, equity and, and you know, for, for years, that is my focus. And so it, again, it's an honor to be in this position and to work with, with our staff attorney like Eric Jantz and just to continue to be in service of um, communities across the state. So um, that's, uh, that's something that Retake has ta taken very seriously as well. I mean, we're largely an Anglo um, staffed organization, if you will, because it's my wife and I, but our allies and accomplices in the work we do are clearly um, from the communities of color and the impacted communities. And it's the focus of a lot of our work. Um, Eric, I wanted to ask you, you know, the um, New Mexico Environmental Law Center obviously has a litigation uh, role and a strategy around using litigation to advance your priorities, but also a legislative one. And I'm wondering, you know, we're rolling right up to 2021 legislative session. We're gonna have a very different New Mexico State Senate. Um, so we may actually be able to get some substantive things done. Um, what is uh, your legislative agenda? Do you have some bills that you're going to be pushing forward? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, we have. Uh, we actually have uh, our legislative priorities set up. We're working on um, uh, lining up allies, sponsors, and and uh, legislative champions for these. Um, but yeah, the the session is breathing down our necks right now. We are. Uh, we are very much uh, engaged in getting uh, our priorities uh, queued up for the 2021 session. Um, so we have sort of uh, four big priorities. Um, first, we have a uh, private right of action bill. Uh, and this is a legislation that would uh, put private rights of action in all uh, the state's environmental statutes. Uh, so essentially, um, <clears throat> when a community is faced with a polluting industry and uh, environmental uh, state or local environmental agencies aren't enforcing the law, the communities will be able to enforce the law on their own behalves, right? Uh, and and this, is, this is a fundamentally envir uh, environmental justice bill, right? Because Absolutely. the communities where enforcement uh, is lax or uh, overlooked, uh, in quotes, uh, are for the most part uh, low income communities of color, right? So those communities really uh, deserve and need uh, this sort of uh, legislation to be able to vindicate the rights that they have in their communities. So that's one of our priorities. Uh, another priority is removing no more stringent than language from the uh, State Air Quality Act and the State Hazardous Waste Act. Uh, both of those state statutes uh, have provisions in them that uh, prevent the, them from deviating from uh, federal law, right? Uh, federal standards. So for example, in the Air Quality Act, uh, when the federal government loosens or reduces pollution standards, as it has been doing under the Trump administration, the state has no choice but to follow. Uh, so that further burdens the communities that are already burdened uh, by industrial air pollution. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and not surprisingly, those are, are uh, uh, low-income communities of color. So this legislation would uh, strip that language from the state statutes and allow the states uh, and local governments in some cases to um, set standards that are higher than the federal standards and adjust uh, for our unique circumstances in, in New Mexico and in our New Mexico communities. Um, the third uh, priority is updating the uh, civil penalties uh, in uh, environmental statutes. 
the amount of money uh, polluters have to pay when they're busted for uh, not following the law uh, haven't really been adjusted in many cases since the 70s. Right. Uh, so when, for example, Chevron, uh, and this is just an example, it's not, not a particular case, but for example, uh, a, a multinational corporation like Chevron or others may uh, end up polluting, they end up having to pay something like a thousand bucks uh, for each violation, which is their petty cash drawer, basically. Uh, this is uh, this legislation is intended to uh, update these penalties so that they uh, so that they meet the goals that they were intended to meet, and that is dissuade uh, polluters from breaking the law. And then the fourth uh, piece of uh, piece of legislation we have uh, involves. Uh, the uh, regulation of uh, so-called produced water. We don't like to call it produced water. Uh, produced water is uh, the waste from, uh, the liquid waste from oil and gas operations. Right. Uh, it's more like a toxic soup. Yep. So that's our, that's our fourth legislative priority. Well, and you'll be happy to know that all four are on our priority list um, for the 2021 session. And that was just announced uh, Wednesday. So uh, we got a heads up from you, so we included them on our list because they're, they're things we've advocated for in the past, but we've got a different Senate now and, and hopefully um, yeah. able to get this through. Um, I need to remind our listeners that um, they're listening to Retake Our Democracy. It's a 30 minute radio show that appears on KSFR 101.1 FM or streaming live from ksfr.org. And we're talking with Virginia uh, Nekachea and um, Eric Jantz from the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. And um, Virginia, um, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, I took a look at your website and you're involved in quite a number of uh, battles um, in, where you're representing and putting centering uh, the people um, against some corporate uh, interests like in Santalina development and um, also you're representing uh, residents in South San Santa Fe in their battle with an uh, asphalt plant that wants to expand its operations. Um, the common thread here is a commitment that you just described so eloquently uh, a few minutes ago. Do you wanna talk a little bit about those cases and how they fit within that umbrella of environmental justice you've spoken of? Well, if, if we're gonna um, head to Santolina, that would take us probably a few shows to even go through all the details um, about that particular case. And I will say that that, you know, Santolina is the connection that I actually had with the Law Center before I became the ED just this August. And I had, you know, we were so thankful, um, those of us who were doing the community organizing work in regards to Santolina, we were thankful that the Law Center um, came on to support us um, pretty early on um, in this battle. And so, and that was the, the, how I was connected to the Law Center and knew of the work um, and just was very deeply appreciative to, you know, and about the support that we received. And Santolina is a major, major issue um, that still looms. If, if we think about just um, if it makes sense to bring, and, and just to provide people a little bit more context, those of you who are listening, um, Santolina Master Plan is a, a major housing development that's proposed to be built on the west side of Albuquerque, spanning um, close to 14,000 acres at build out. It would have um, about 37,000 homes projected population of about 95,000 residents. And so we're truly talking about a new city that would be comparable to the size of um, Rio Rancho um, on the west side of Albuquerque. And this, this um, plan was introduced back in late 2013, um, early 2014. So it's been a battle that's been going on for a while and it was proposed to the community as this amazing, green, sustainable, um, new housing development, the new city on the, on the hill to be built and that 
we should all be appreciative because of um, you know, the, the jobs that it would bring with it and just, you know, the community, the new community that would be built. But, you know, many of us had heard that story before. Some of us know about SunCal. That was the previous development that was proposed at the, in the same location prior to um, Santolina. So, so people didn't buy into that. Uh, Mesa del Sol also stands as a perfect example of these major housing developments that just don't pan out. And many of us in um, that became core organizing members and concerned individuals regarding Santolina, we um, started organizing because we were very worried about the how it would impact our precious and limited water resources. And I know that just um, a, a bit ago, Paul, you had um, uh, you know, a, a Zoominar to talk about water issues across the state and Santolina ties completely into, you know, you know, this reality of understanding the very limited water resources we have in our state and how it falls upon all of us and especially those people in power to make the wisest water decisions that we possibly can. And when you look at um, whether or not the, you know, we need Santolina, we, we don't. There's, there's plenty of um, opportunity um, for, say, if we had this growing population, there's plenty of space in already built um, plant housing areas and cities to accommodate people. Um, and then again, if we just look at water, we clearly do not have the water resources Right. to justify this major housing development. And so when we look at it, um, you know, the, the whole plan, it is clearly yet another environmental injustice that would most impact, um, you know, many of the neighboring communities um, that would be, that would, you know, be neighbors to this major development. So the development would in essence impact the water resources of many of the vecinos that would be close by. And so it's just, it, it doesn't make sense, but it's unfortunate that it's still looming, um, which, which is at this point, years later, it's terrible to realize that it still is pending. And I, I, you know, I wanna pass it to Eric to give just a quick update on where we're at as far as um, the legal cases of Santo Lina. Okay, Eric. We've got about, I just want to alert you, we've got about one more minute for the radio show, and then we'll do a, a 10 or 15 second pause, five second pause, and resume for the podcast and go forward as long as we can keep Virginia here. Um, but Eric has agreed to stick around. So I just want to, before, we'll take that question and that amplification uh, during the podcast, I want to ask you if, if you can just give our listeners information about if they want more uh, about the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, um, how they can reach you. And I also want to thank you, Virginia, and you, Eric, for joining us today. This has been a very interesting show. And please tell us where they can get more information. Yes, yeah, so I encourage um, the community to please um, find more information on our website nmelc.org um, and also stay connected with us through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But I would say the, the best way is to subscribe to our database. And that way um, the public is able to just receive all the latest news and events um, from the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. Okay, well, thank you very much for being with us. Um, I'm not sure who we're gonna have next week, but again, I would remind our listeners to go to our website and sign up for the Zoominar we have on December 1st with Sen Senator Peter Wirth and Speaker of the House, uh, Brian Eval. Thank you very much for listening and tune in on, K on retakeourdemocracy.org on the Retake Conversations to listen to the rest of this discussion with Eric and Virginia. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we're back by Miracle of Podcast. And okay, I can stay on for about another 10 minutes. Paul. Okay.
Okay. And we've actually answered a lot of questions that we put at the back of the uh, 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 of the interview format that I shared with you. So we'll, we'll, we'll make this work quite easily. Um, Eric, you're going to update us on some litigation, and then we'll talk a little bit about that <clears throat> plan. Sure. So uh, with respect to Santa Lina, uh, this is an, from, a, from a legal perspective and a procedural perspective, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, so at this point, uh, we have one set of cases in the Court of Appeals. We're um, uh, currently working on a brief uh, in another set of appeals to the Court of Appeals, and that should be filed uh, within the next 30 days. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's an ongoing litigation. You know, typically when uh, we, I, we bring on new clients and I'm working with them, I, uh, I tell them that legal time is a lot like geologic time and <laughs> that they can expect to be working with me and the law center for many, many years to come. Uh, and Santa Lina is no different. Um, with respect to the, the question you had about uh, the uh, asphalt batch plant, hot mix asphalt plant in South Santa Fe, uh, that's another case, uh, important case that we're working on. Uh, and that case is actually indicative of uh, a problem that we're seeing all across the state, right? Um, particularly in Albuquerque where the uh, city's environmental health department uh, basically rubber stamps every permit for asphalt batch plants uh, in uh, a few neighborhoods, low-income communi uh, communities of color, Mountain View, San Jose, and, and Greater Gardner particularly. Um, uh, and, you know, these are, these are really nasty uh, operations. They, uh, they emit all kinds of uh, carcinogenic and otherwise harmful uh, air toxics. Um, they uh, produce a lot of dust. Uh, they produce a lot of other kinds of particulate matter. And, you know, they, they're not operations that should be uh, located where people live. I, I mean, it's, it's that simple. Right. Um, yet there they are. Uh, and in, San, in South Santa Fe, uh, there is currently a request uh, for, from a, a, an operator to consolidate several of its asphalt uh, batch plants and aggregate crushing operations into one big uh, operation uh, on the uh, west side of, uh, of uh, 599 uh, near Airport Road. And this is, this is all, already a, an area where there are a lot of uh, other operations uh, that are doing the same thing, uh, as well as a concentration of uh, non-asphalt um, pollu uh, air polluting operations, things like scrapyards, the airport, right? I mean, airports are tremendous sources of, of uh, particulate matters, fine particulates and um, uh, volatile organic compounds, right? So. Now, this is a, an area that uh, an area that's already burdened by a significant concentration of polluting industries, and our clients, Earth Care, and uh, some individual folks in the um, adjoining neighborhoods uh, have uh, are going have challenged or will be challenging uh, the uh, state environment department's issuance of of a permit for this asphalt batch plant. Um, and you know, so far we've had, uh, already had one success. The environment department uh, uh, changed the proposed, the draft permit uh, the weekend before we uh, were supposed to have filed uh, our technical testimony, giving us uh, about 48 hours to evaluate this new permit. Uh, we filed an emergency motion with the hearing officer and we got an extension of time uh, to evaluate that permit and uh, see how it, uh, how it uh, may affect the community. So, uh, and I think it's a credit to the, to the community that they have been very vocal 
uh, and that they've been very, uh, there's been solidarity uh, amongst neighborhoods in opposition to this, this, uh, this operation. Yeah, I'm not sure you know Miguel Acosta, who's the co-director at Earth Care. He's a board member for Retake Our Democracy. And we had him on the show last week talking about the asphalt plant. And, um, and Earth Care is just does a dynamite job of organizing and talk, of, talk about centering the population. They also started the Yucca Youth United for Climate Catastrophe Action. Um, and that group, you know, it's, it's not uh, just propping up a few young students and, and adults making all the decisions. It's really an authentically led organization by young uh, students of color. And um, it, it's uh, becoming a powerful force in Santa Fe and uh, beyond that. So um, it's great to see that you're working so closely um, with that organization and in this context. Um, I wanted to ask both of you, you know, the, the, it's just impossible not to feel like 2020 has just been this barrage of, um, of things cascading on us that seem to be outside of our power to control or to um, affect, and uh, whether it's COVID or Trump. And how is it that uh, each of you keep um, a sense of hope? And, and do you, what do you see in 2020? 2021 that maybe can uplift us a bit. Um, we'll start with you, Virginia, because you have to leave soon. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, of course, you know, just recently, many of us had that uplifting and hope instilled in us once again, um, because it's been really rough for the environmental um, world and work for the last few years. And so there's hope in that, but it's important for us to understand that even with the pending change of administration, there's a long, long road of true equity work ahead of us. And that's one thing that I, I remind um, myself and people that I work with that um, deep and true equity work is, is a lifelong commitment. It's not something that you just reach with a workshop or a, a webinar or an institute, you are truly making a lifelong commitment to achieving equity and justice for, for everyone, and especially for those communities that are being most impacted. And, and you know, you mentioned COVID, Paul, and I, I you know, and, and, and I want to connect it back to a, you know, part of the conversation you had with Miguel last week. And Miguel is a very good friend of mine. I'm deeply appreciative of Miguel's work. Um, and you all were talking about COVID. Right. And that ties into environmental justice. And all we have to do is look at who is being most impacted by COVID and who is dying from COVID. And that is so linked to this continued environmental injustice that um, impacts our communities in the state. And if we look at the current numbers and we, we use a more critical lens in looking at who, um, who, has been, who has contracted COVID and who has unfortunately died as a result of COVID, it clearly has been our indigenous communities. And it has to be you know, directly linked with these ongoing environmental injustices that have been placed and have been burdening communities for so long, for decades. And so that's another, you know, just point about when we talk about environmental justice, it means that we are going to be honest and have these honest conversations about um, the impacts, the long enduring impacts, the legacy of, you know, environmental racism on our communities. And so what gives me hope, of course, my children, uh, my family, my elders, ceremony, my traditions, and just knowing that I'm doing right by continuing to serve the communities across the state. So thank you, Paul, for asking that. Thank you um, for your answer. And, um, you know, Miguel also spoke about, you had mentioned the indigenous community being impacted and the Navajo Nation clearly was just decimated by, and it, you know, it's no coincidence when you don't have running water 
and um, uh, you don't have electricity in some cases, um, that it's going to be difficult for you to comply with um, safety measures and pre preventive measures that can limit the the impact of the. And if you don't have access to healthcare facilities, um, it's obviously going to impact your um, ability to resist this disease. Um, and the, similarly in San, South Santa Fe, um, that's where a disproportionate uh, 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 incidences of the COVID are occurring. And Miguel talked a bit about um, how the testing but done by the state, you know, testing isn't available there as easily as it is in other parts of the city. So there's, uh, it's, it, it's what you say, it's systemic. It's not just, and it's not a coincidence. And I think, uh, um, we, we have to start really examining how policies that we assume are in the community's best interest are really narrowly prescribed and um, don't address the needs of communities that are historically marginalized and disserved. Yeah, we just, I mean, just to emphasize, Paula, what you said, law policies and regulations are not enforced equitably. Right. Or fair. And so that, that I just want to follow up with that. Yep, it's a moral issue. It's not just a legal and a regulatory. Eric, what about you? Um, what gives you hope in this uh, environment? Well, yeah, it's it's uh, it's sometimes difficult uh, to see the silver linings in our current environment. But uh, what does give me hope is uh, the fact that. Um, we're, we're working in partnership with uh, really resilient communities, right? Uh, and these communities, uh, uh, you know, they are in many cases fighting, and, and you know, I, I don't want this to sound hyperbolic because it's not, uh, fighting for their lives in many instances on a daily basis, yet somehow, uh, they remain, uh, they remain uh, warm and uh, gracious and uh, uh, patient, you know, with uh, lawyers who aren't living in their communities coming in and uh, working with them, right? Uh, so that's all, I mean, that to me is a, a very sustaining uh uh, situation. Um, uh, like Virginia, my, my family uh, is important and, and uh, sustains me through all this. Uh, and, you know, as an extension to, of that, the staff at the law center, right? Uh, uh, we have a great staff. We support each other. We all know how difficult this work is for us and the folks that we work with. Uh, and so we always have each other's backs and that's really, really important. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us today. Um, this wasn't the easiest show to get on the books. We wound up with all kinds of scheduling <laughs> snafus and then we had it all set up for last week uh, and, or for this week, earlier this week, and the internet went down for Eric and for me. And so uh, I'm glad the internet worked. It can go down now and I'll you know, we're done. <laughs> and, uh, um, but thank you very much for being with us. And if you want to tell our listeners once again, uh, Virginia Nekachea and Eric Jantz, how can they get more information on the New Mexico Environmental Law Center? Yes, thank you, Paul, again, um, for having us. And please stay connected with us. Um, subscribe to our database, our mailing list by visiting our website, nmelc.org. Or you can also find us um, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we just look forward to being connected with um, your listeners and the public. So thanks again, Paul. Okay, thank you both.